Eric's uh, got a video up here. He's, he's uh, um, experimenting or trying to incorporate uh, post tensioning into his uh, Barnuminiums. Uh, this is Eric over at Texas Barnuminium there. And he's talking about post tensioning here. And w what you have here is a profile. It's your, uh, this is probably more the just the pad loading. And this might be where he's going to have a wall system that will be a, uh, also a roof load. Uh, the deviation at that point being lower. And down here also maybe another uh, load-bearing wall. I don't know. I'd like to see his plans. But let's go ahead and, and, and give him a little correction for him. Let's stack right about there. And he's going to talk about that it puts the concrete in tension. It puts it in compression by using tension in the cables. But here we go. He's, he's new to it. So, you know, little, little thing. But we're going to talk about fiber too. It's a lot of cables on this lab. All these cables are going to put this foundation under tension. We don't want the we don't want the concrete under tension. Tension is where concrete fails, Eric. So if you've got you're putting down four thousand or six thousand psi concrete, I don't know what the engineer spec for your for your uh, issue here for your con for your uh, post tensioning along with the soil conditions, but the uh, and the compression obviously of the tendons. The uh, you you also going to talk about fire. He's going to talk about fibers. Let's get to the fibers, and I'll tie this back in in just a moment. And uh, hopefully keep it from cracking. So you might be wondering what this is right here. This uh, let's go fast forward a little bit. Right. However, if you have I don't know a, a house that's all cut up where where pretty much you don't have any straight lines anywhere. Um, you might you go ten feet and then you come in. 30 feet and then you go out and you know like a conventional custom home a lot of times post tension is not a very good candidate for those homes all right whenever you have a lot of uh jagged edges or corners and all that stuff post tension here. becomes harder to do just because of the nature of the the foundation so a lot of times when you're doing stuff like that then rebar is your best bet. So, again, if you're going to have it engineered, if you have a choice, I would probably pick post tension uh, just because we have less chance of cracking. However, rebar, there is nothing wrong with it. Uh, again, get it engineered. Tr All right, let, let's, let's trust your engineer, consult with them, tell them what you're doing. All right, so, so for Eric and, and anyone else, post tension is an active system, it's active. It's, this pad is in compression right now. Rebar is a passive system. Once the crack develops and the load is present, so you can have a crack and then it's no longer moving. Um, there's no there's no load on it. Then it's back. It, it can go in and out. It can cycle. Your uh, your rebar can. But this is always active. It's always active. Whereas concrete is passive. It just lays there until a point uh, that you have a crack. And the crack based on loading. Now he's got expansive soil here in Texas. I was going to do another video for actually, you know, related to the stuff there in Texas. For the soil to expand and contract, it needs moisture. It needs to get moisture in it. So more than likely, uh, you can see the the grade that is, the, the grades here are pretty flat. They're not pitching away from the property. So there, there is the the water can build up here and work your way under this pad. Doing this type of uh, soil is expansive, meaning that once water gets in it, it will expand. But when it dries, when it dries, it will get smaller. And at that point, you no longer have full contact of your pad to the soil. You now have a void underneath your soil. And I showed you guys in the garage uh, system that I worked on how I can you can just see it. I can see it beforehand. Determine determine it by the cracks. Um, so now what happens is that the load, in this case, if it was, if you were to, let's see if we can get a different screw going past his head here. If you were to um, have expansion and contraction under, say, this area right here, let's say, let's say that's three foot over, and let's say over here, water sits there, expands and contracts, expands and contracts, so much so that you can see under the pad now. At that point, this pad, it has a cantilever from the supported section to the unsupported section. That puts a lot more stress on these on these tendons, which can cause tendons to fail and pop. So in an expansive soil location, you really want to monitor your outside area and make sure that water's not pooling here. There's 
There was no good. There was no good news about what coming outside. And you see pooling water outside your property in an expansive soil, and it's and it's butting against your property. It's pooling water. There is no good news about that. You want that water to get away from there. You want that water away from the foundation to get away. Uh, you know, you got to do multiple ways. Now, um, there is a, it's an interesting bridge, and maybe I can do a video on that. It's in Greece, where they could not get to the sub base, uh, to the uh, substrate of the uh, uh, structural base to put the bridge in. It was just too far down to put the piers in. And so they used rebar, if you will, just in the soils. And then you cap the rebar, and then you uh, you can now build on top of that. It's much bigger than that. You guys can track it down. It's Greece. I gave you a little hint. And you'll, you'll love that, uh, um, you know, whatever you can find on that. It's an amazing, amazing footer system that is now time-tested. I think I think it should it would work great out here in the barn dominiums area where you can just start driving rebar down, but they don't have the engineering technology here yet. And so consequently, it's still trying to be resolved by rebar and post-tensioning and not by uh, removing the soils and trying at it did this this magically beautiful new way of rebar. Um, and, you know, get their advice. Uh, again, if they recommend one over the other, it's not a bad deal. They're both great systems. That's it. Uh, yeah. Another thing that we're looking into is fiber. But that's all I got to say for now. <laughs> I don't know. Down here in South Texas, we hardly ever do fiber. So, uh, however, I know up north they use it a lot. So I'm looking into that. All right. So let's talk about the fiber real quick. The fiber again would be a waste for Eric because once you have once you have cracking from expansive soil, you have a void underneath your a void is now taking place underneath your concrete, your pad, and more than likely your voids unless he has a uh, a uh, the soil has a uh, surface water that he put it over by mistake, you know, not knowing it was existing, um, like a vein of water, then the water is coming from the rain, and that's going to be issues for the foundation uh, within this area, whatever, whichever amount of distance the water can uh, sponge into the expansive soil. So fiber out here is nothing. If it's long as he has full contact or you have full contact on a structurally sound base, which this would be in here, the field part, there is no reason to have fiber. Fiber is great. Again, it's a, it's a fiber is like many rebar. It's a passive system, not active. So again, once you get cracking, then the fibers will kick in. And once you load it, crack and loading, then you, the fibers will kick in holding like rebar. And I love fiber myself. I use it on my vertical surfaces, which I did a couple of videos for you guys on that already. I use it on vertical surfaces. I think it's awesome. Um, and, and I do like it for uh, you know crack control crack control and like a driveway but this patio is not going to see oh correction his he does have a barn dominium but it's part um loaded with uh um, with uh with uh i don't know what they loaded with trucks but the truck area yeah i can see the fibers in there helping with crack control but it it, it it's the rebar um would be uh, uh it gives you more cantilever effect than than does um, fiber, but this will do even you know do you even more of a solid. This it's about bridging the voids. In this case, the voids are going to be again going to be around the edges unless he happens to hit a a uh, you know you build on a lot here and you didn't know it, but when it rains here, the water builds up and all of a sudden water pressure pushes up in the middle right here, you know thirty feet into your pad. Um, but that would be an odd an odd duck. Otherwise. Uh, your outside surface is what your your money is best spent for. I would even go as far as saying, uh, you know, putting a a protective layer of concrete out here, um, 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 uh, roll roll rubber roofing, the real rubber roofing, anything that gets the water away from this foundation and puts the pooling somewhere else and away from this foundation, and you should have no cracks. Any other cracks, you just craftsmanship. You know, the, you, you didn't let it cure properly, um, things like that. So fiber, mm, again, it's a, it's, an, it's a passive system, 
not active. This is the only active system here, right here. This is active. It's kicking butt. Now, this would be great for the loaded area for the, for the vehicles, um, but this seems to be uniformly placed everywhere except for this might be, I don't know, he does grade beams, so this might be in the, in the grade beam, this lower uh, profile tendon. All right, I'm going to terminate video. I'm looking at my notes real quick, but I'm going to terminate video and just wanted to share that. So I, I just looked at my notes, so I need to address this then. Let's say they bring trucks in here. Well, hydraulic loading, the truck comes in, slams on brakes. It has a point load at the tire. The front tire has more point load than the rest of the vehicle. Um, being that it's loaded with the engine up front and the, the brake force is more in the front. You can actually determine how much brake force each vehicle has, mostly by going to motor vehicle and they have, well, where we are, you slam on brakes and they check your, uh, you know, it tells you your, your brake force in the front of the vehicle. You can you can determine it with this much speed uh, that will be approaching and stopping in the, in the uh, carport area what your, what your loads would be specifically where those tires are and the loads would, would, would go outwards. So you don't want to really come here and jam on brakes and jamming on brakes that can overstress the concrete to the point of failure, cracks, and then your post tension in this case would pick up and keep those cracks closed. It's, it's, it would take the, it would take the, whatever these post tensions uh, at, say you were right here, it would take that full amount of this to elongate Plus, say his concrete's four four thousand or six thousand psi, so we take the full amount of that plus the uh, uh, only four hundred psi. But that's a lot, four hundred pounds per square inch, or that's for four thousand, or roughly if it's six thousand psi concrete, six hundred pounds per square inch. Remember, the front tires have a, a the you're going to divide the full load of the vehicle among the uh, surface area, contact surface area of the tires. So it's going to take a hell of a lot to do it. But if you wanted to do a little extra right there for crack control, uh, rebar, in addition to the, uh, hmm, um, yeah, you got to be careful with the with the rebar could uh, conflict the post tensioning a little bit. But uh, rebar would be a nice uh, um, addition for the tires where the car would be coming in stopping. The rest of it, I just don't see the loads. It's human traffic in there, human trafficking, right? Yeah, I couldn't resist that. All right, take care, guys.